Hello, I'm Anne McLean for Concerts from the Library of Congress. This week, our season continues with the truly stellar Jack Quartet as part of a special virtual residency at the library. And I hope you'll be watching their amazing concert for us here on our website. I'm so delighted to be talking today with two members of the Jack Quartet, violist John Pickford Richards and violinist Chris Otto, and also a friend and colleague, composer Jeffrey Mumford. Welcome. We've been really excited about presenting you in this residency for many reasons. Your virtuosity, your spirit of adventure and inquiry, and your passionate advocacy for diversity and democracy in contemporary music. You're known for the quote that I see on your website that you are expanding the notion of what a string quartet can be. So as our concert universe expands now in the digital realm, you, I know, are expanding your practice as artists in a world where the creation and consumption of music cannot be the same. And I understand you have some very interesting things coming along that you're doing. I wanted to ask you, how will this new artistic realm that you're in be reflected in your concert for us and in your residency? John, since we've had a brief conversation yeah. on the phone, <laughs> would you like to talk about this? We were playing a real game of chicken there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, what's interesting about this, uh, our program for the library's residency is that it, it spans an unusually wide amount of time for the the repertoire that we normally play. Um, the the real inspiration uh, for, or the centerpiece of the, of the residency is Elliot Carter's Third String Quartet, which is this huge epic piece uh, that we've been working on for years. Um, and it, it occurred to us that the piece uh, reminds us of a lot of music that happened before it, um, but also has clear influences on the more current music that we normally play. Um, and so we reached into the medieval times and the Aristotelian period um, to sort of bring back this obscure piece uh, that Chris arranged actually by an artist uh, with the pen name Rodericus. Uh, it's this really interesting two voice medieval piece that uh, Chris brought into the string quartet realm. Um, and, uh, but then we also really felt a strong connection with uh, the music of Ruth Crawford Seeger uh, who really seemed to sort of predate Carter's ideas and uh, everything that we think about Carter really exists in her music. Um, but uh, what about 30 years before? And, uh, and then of course um, we're featuring Carter's music uh, and also the duo that Austin plays with pianist Conrad Tao. Um, but then uh, it occurred to me when we, when you and I first started talking Anne about this residency, um, Austin had just, recorded a solo violin piece by our friend Taishan Sori. And um, I, I heard it playing on Instagram in the other room. I didn't know what piece it was. And I was like, is that, is that Carter? And, but then I ended up being Taishan's piece. And, um, and, uh, and so it seemed like a really beautiful connection. And the, the timing of our conversation with Austin recording that was kind of perfect. Um, and so then we also wanted to program the string quartet that Taishan wrote for us a few years ago, um, which all together creates quite a huge program. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, and that one came out of your BAMF project about the evolution of the string quartet, right? Yeah. And evolution is a pretty good word, actually, to describe this whole residency. Um, yeah, uh, at the BAMF Center, uh, normally, uh, each summer we go for three weeks to work with about 10 preformed string quartets. Um, and the faculty consists of an early music group, a group that focuses on more traditional repertoire, and then us who play lots of weird new music, uh, which again, that's sort of this residency in a nutshell. You know, I wanted to ask all of you to talk about these links between the Ruth Crawford Seeger and the Carter because it's so fascinating. And until you, John, mentioned this to me, I hadn't made that connection. I know that she, in her own comments about her string quartet, talks about layers of rhythms. And I just really noticed that today when I was looking into some information about her. But if you can tell us the story of how you trace this link, and Jeffrey, too, jump 
jump in uh, after that and talk. Let's talk about the context of how you see them fitting together. Um, yeah, one of the thing, one of the connections between all the pieces is that they're all kind of um, innovating in different ways. And the Ruth Crawford Seeger piece really um, some of the first movement, for example, deals with this idea of stratification of different voices and different characters, like totally different worlds happening parallel to each other sometimes. And like your ability to sort of perceive like multiple um, streams of thought um, simultaneously is really quite interesting in, in her piece, especially the first movement. And, um, and that's exactly the same principle as the well, not exactly, but um, the Carter's third quartet is also much, very much about that um, dichotomy between the two duos and each thing having its own character and independent stream, but yet they sort of all fit together at the same time. Do you happen to know if uh, Carter ever wrote about her music? Uh, did he acknowledge that uh, influence? I'm not aware of any research that Carter has done on Seeger personally, but it certainly he was around. I can't believe he hadn't heard it. Mm -hmm. um, he was incredibly intellectually curious person, and um, having the pleasure of studying with him, I know he had an encyclopedic knowledge of the repertoire. So I can't believe he did not know about it. Um, how intimately he knew about it, I doubt. I can't. I don't know. It's very interesting, you know, the the startlingly innovative use of Disney counterpoint for her time was just remarkable. I, guess, I think this was just right after she had been in Germany to study for a while. Um, but even now, it's still startling. Um, mm. And I, I'm just, just oh, oh, I wanted to mention that the library has now processed her entire collection. Oh, nice. Uh, and it's wonderful that this is now available to scholars in a very detailed way. Um, all the letters and, you know, all the scores, everything that she did from the very early days through her work as a folk songs transcriber and so on. And we also have her... Uh, Charles Seeger's collection as well. So it's, it's a huge statement about American music at that time. So she was, would you say she was an ultra modernist? I know people use that term of Henry Cowell, who was a strong supporter of hers. I guess she could be, she could be seen as that. I mean, she certainly was way ahead of her time and, and, and the work that she was doing was, was very groundbreaking. Um, it's a shame that she left us with so little music because I would love to know where she would have gone if she had continued in that vein and she kind of stopped. Um, but you know, the when I first heard her that piece, I, I was just blown away by how how much it did anticipate Carter and and, and the degree to which the dissonant counterpoint and, and, and the polyrhythms and the ideas of, of how things just kind of um evolve throughout the the range of the whole four instruments um, really inspired me personally, um, of course. Regarding the third quartet, the, the Carter Quartet, and we have that manuscript score, and I think, John, you said you had looked at it at the library. You had, you had uh, done some scholarly research on the Carter holdings that we have, which are extensive. Um, I know that Austin, your colleague, said that this work was really one of the big influences his, on him and Carter's music in general in being a quartet player. And this has become a real focus for the Jack, hasn't it? I, I know you've done these incredible marathons of all the quartets. When you, uh, and you're cited for breathtaking virtuosity in terms of managing them, I was going to mentioned that when the Juilliard Quartet used to play these quartets at the library, that was still in the era long ago when they had the click tracks, you know, that kept people together, which was maybe 40 years ago or something like that. And then now you play these pieces, of course, with such freedom and uh, power and so on. Um, what are the challenges for you? I know they're challenging even for today players like you. Or this piece in particular. Yeah. Oh, uh, do you want to go ahead, John? Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry, I wasn't sure if that was directed toward John or me, but um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges with this particular piece, even though it's almost 50 years old now, um, and it's um, 
part of it is the timing of it. Um, oftentimes we're in different um, subdivisions of the meter such that we have to feel different pulses at the same time within each duo. So um, that means, and also because of the separation, the spatial separation, um, basically most of the time it's John and I conducting different beat patterns at the same time and trying to land on the downbeats together. Um, so you can totally understand, yeah, yeah, try to imagine conducting one pattern at one tempo with the other te pattern. And then on top of which you're playing all the notes, which are incredibly difficult in and of themselves. So um, it's interesting to see how uh, different groups have navigated this. Um, and I remember the Juilliard Quartet, we met with some of the original members that um, had been involved in premiering the piece and they talked about how they felt it in this huge pulse which was like the entire bar in one beats and just see you on the next downbeat and then you know um so it's that's that's one of the big challenges um that are pretty unique to this piece um it's the combination of the spatialization and the different tempos at the same time um uh, the we definitely made click tracks and practiced that with them a lot, but um, but ultimately it does give us more freedom if we can react to each other live, you know, and not have to be to stick to a, a click. And these are uh, for people who won't have seen this piece, we've heard this piece before. These you are space spatially isolated, uh, which is resonant these days. But you on the stage, it's two versus two, right? Or maybe not versus, but yeah. Oppose, and then you have um, times when you're doing totally different things. With and I was going to ask all of you, all three of you, you often read about Carter's music in the context of abstract expressionist painting and literature, um, and I've heard people talk about Joycean textures, you know, of language and so on. Layers of textures is what you really perceive. And I was curious, in terms of characterization and drama, are there any, do you know of anything, was he a fan of the theater? How did he, this is such a, a predominant thing when you listen to these works, they're very dramatic. What do you know about his interests? Well, I know that Carter, um, certainly in his first string quartet, referenced Joyce, in particular Finnegan's Wake, um, as influence. Uh -huh. and, um, in Ulysses, um, and you can see that in the way the opening cello solo then appears later on as viola material, and then end, ends the, very, the piece as a violin. The same material because it works its way through um, the movement. Yeah. But in each time it appears, it appears in a different context. I love the music going around it. And Jeffrey, you've talked about this piece. For you, you see it as a painting where the listener steps into the frame. Was that what you had expressed? Yeah, as if you were, there was an ongoing, this material is ongoing, and you're stepping into something that's already happening. Um, as if I have my notes here. But um, yes, yeah, so the idea of this, this artificial frame, um, which music, exist in any way. Um, but in this piece, the idea of these two duos working, I won't say an opposition, because there are there are there are similarities, there are there are there are references to to uh, um, other material, shared material, not very very often, but they play play past each other. Um, and one has six sections, one has four sections. Um, I find that very interesting, not the least of which is because the idea of conversation and, and, and interior dialogue with each other. The, the duos have interior dialogues, and then they have this overall dialogue with, between the two duos, if that makes sense. You know, I, I found a note that he had made himself, Mr. Carter, talking about behavioral patterns of the instruments, which is kind of an interesting concept. But he says that this kind of form and texture could be said to reflect the experience we often have of seeing something in different frames of reference at the same time. So that's mm -hmm. his, own, his own take on it, which is interesting. 
Um, moving to the Carter Duo, which is uh, our commission, a landmark commission for the library. Of course, that's a, a powerfully complex piece too, and very thorny. I know that Conrad Tao will be playing it with you. But sorry, I know Conrad Tao will be performing this with Austin. Um, what do you think? How do you think that this piece fits in connection to the quartet? Why did you? Why did you think of this third quartet once we mentioned that we'd love to have you do the duo as opposed to any of the other quartets? Um, yeah, I think they're, um, first of all, they're kind of a, the third is, for, first of all, just my personal favorite quartet. And um, I think it's around the same time period as the um, duo, but it has a very different formal structure. So there's um, there's that connection, but also I think seeing Carter Three as a hub of other connections as well. That's it's sort of our our duo is our link to the Carter Quartets, which is our link to a whole bunch of other music that we love, um, including like the Rodericus and the Ruth Crawford Seeger and Taishan's piece, and all of those specifically more relate to Carter Three. Um, but the duo also. Um, introduces, I don't know, it's, it introduces a contrast actually formally to all the other pieces in that it's a kind of more, um, even though it's very extreme, it's, um, it's some, in some ways kind of classical, a classical romantic kind of gestural and theatrical like we were talking about earlier. So um, I think like it does serve as a, a different perspective on the work of, on the output of Carter. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think this is a wonderful program, and I, I know a lot of the music will be uh, new for many viewers. And uh, I wanted to talk, too, about um, Taishan's piece and about your work with the fascinating Jack Studio and Jack Frontiers programs. And I was thinking about the remarkable sense of community that you guys are known for. You are really developing an artistic community and you are so generous spirited. Um, and I wanted to ask you how you develop these two notions, both of those, Jack Studio and Jack Frontier, and how Taishan's piece grew out of the studio experience. Yeah, well, our first idea was uh, to develop our own concert series at home in New York. And this is how Jack Frontiers came to be. It was a way for us to completely on our own curate concerts of music that we think is at the forefront of, of music today. Um, and so we started doing that and that's how we commissioned, that's how we arranged for the commission for Taishan Sori was to feature his music in this series. Um, it occurred to us um, after we had gotten that started that we could only really program or commission artists who we were aware of, but there are so many artists out there who we're not aware of and who don't have access to a group like Jack Quartet for so many different possible reasons, maybe for reasons that they weren't able to be at the schools that we visit or the summer festivals that we go to or for reasons of systemic uh, it, like trouble getting having access to any kind of musical training. Uh, there's yeah. there's so many roadblocks to working with a group, um, especially a professional group. Um, and so then we developed Jack Studio as a way to invite artists from not even just musical backgrounds, but any kind of artistic background to apply to either have works um, developed and commissioned by Jack or uh, workshopped and recorded or, or uh, we also make studio recordings of pieces, um, which all together um, both increases the number of pieces for string quartet, which is inherent in our mission, um, but also it provides opportunities for especially younger artists uh, to uh, develop their portfolio and work with a professional ensemble. 
I didn't know that you involved other arts as well, other art forms. I, I, that's exciting. That's wonderful. You know, one of the, in, later on in the residency, we do hope that you might be able to uh, link us on our site with some things, interesting things that you're doing. And Julia Bum, Bumke, is that how she says her name? Yeah, Julia Bumke was um, telling me that you're doing all sorts of interesting things right now, particularly during the pandemic. And she mentioned one project you have where you're recording all 60 parts of one composition together or something. What What is that? You can just say what that project is. Sounds fascinating. Yeah, one of our, um, our studio artists that um, started working with us last year was Eduardo Aguilar from Oaxaca, Mexico. And he, um, he wrote not only a string quartet, but he also wrote um, a piece for 60 strings in a surround sound or a, ideally surrounding the audience in this in this uh, three, you know, spatialized setup um, with both double basses. So it would be string orchestra. Um, but when the pandemic hit, we kind of thought we were stuck at home and um, we were like, well, you know, why don't we just record this um, piece and then make, you know, make an installation version of it because we can't get 60 people together these days. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I actually have happened to have a double bass at my house made by this weird luthier named Carlene Hutchins who redesigned all the instruments. Anyway, um, so I recorded the bass parts and we're all recording them and then we're going to um, present them. We're not even sure how, but there must be multiple ways to do it, but um, hopefully to give the listener a 3D immersive experience of the piece. Um, yeah. It's one of the we're, things we we're do. doing some things with 3D as well. And that, that leads me to ask you, what kinds of, uh, she also gave me a preview that you're doing some pretty interesting things with video and the way that you conceive creating your projects. Do you feel like you would like to say what those some of those are? Y yeah, well, I mean, all of our projects these days seem to be video projects as well, um, which I think is great. Uh, it's, it's very engaging. And uh, some of the artists are c conceiving of their ideas uh, just as music, and then we're making videos. But then we are working with one artist in particular named Natasha Deals uh, on a project that involves, uh, well, I mean, she's a musical composer, but also creates a lot of really great video work to go with her music. And so we're making, I think, six music videos for this ongoing project called Beautiful Trouble. Um, I think we're up to three three episodes now. Wonderful. But stay tuned, it's really great. So much of the challenge for everyone who's producing music for video now is to create as much as possible the sense of intimacy, which we need so much now. And Jeffrey and I've talked about this a lot lately is, is just the tremendous need to connect through music in whatever way that we all can. And I'm so excited that you are exploring so many things. And this, um, the technological realm is one. And as I say, we also are looking into 3D, capturing uh, 3D performance as one, one way. Uh, and I wanted to, um, to ask you too about the role of the composer. This is for all three of you. What do you feel is the role of the composer? I know many of the people, several of you in the Jack Quartet are composers and, and this is an important part of your lives. Um, how do you look at the role of the composer today, particularly this very moment that we're in? It's a tough one. Those are right. Um, or let's, let's, let let me rephrase this. How do you feel about the? What do you think about the role of the artist and the composer today? Well, I yeah. Think, I mean, yeah, go on. I mean, I'll just say I think like for me, um, music is feeds our souls. Like, and it's become even more clear to me what what the purpose of music is personally. And um, obviously it's indivi an individual thing, but it's also a collective thing and a community. And um, to me, it's addressing, music is actually addressing some fundamental aspects of 
ourselves as humans and um, our minds and our music can speak in a language that no other medium can. And um, obviously I can't put into words what the purpose of music is or what the meaning of it is necessarily, but somehow I, I feel like it's necessary to deal with um, just the whole aspect of our being, what it means to be alive and feeling um, through this medium and somehow it, it affects everything and it's connected to everything for me. So. Well, building on that, I mean, it, it is what I do. I mean, it, it is, I mean, I, um, I grew up in a house with enormous diversity of musical influence from Count Basie, Ray Charles to Kismet and, and, and everything in between. My father was a dentist and introduced us to a great deal of jazz. And also um, the first recording I'd heard of the Beethoven Emperor Concerto with Clifford Curzon. Very, very wide spectrum of influences and in jazz ballads with lush string art, um, arrangements. For me, it, it opens a world for me. Um, and in the process, you talked about the role of the composer, the role of the artist. I think the world needs what we do more now than ever. Um, not to sound pretentious, but the idea of expression and 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 communal sharing of of what makes civilization civilization it's, i guess I'd, I'd say no less than that uh, especially at these times and especially whereas we're waiting for the outcome of this we need to understand what do we treasure in civilization what does civilization mean what does it mean to be a civilized human being what does it mean to create a piece of artwork, whether it be music or art, dance, whatever, that compels one to expand themselves and go on a journey where they, they, that they have never been on before. When I listen, for instance, to the music of Brahms, I can listen to the same piece over and over and, and still hear something new. And for him, what I strive in my own work, there are never any wasted notes in his music. And he takes you on a journey where you leave home and where you end up is inevitable, but you don't, you it could go no other place than it ends where you've, where you've, where you've landed, if that makes sense. Yeah. Does that make sense? It, yeah. I, yeah. I, I um, so much wanted to, to talk to you. I appreciate all three of you talking about this because it's something that at the library, we are so conscious of, you know, why do a virtual series? Why, why take this, step into a new world of production that we had never done before. Are people really going to watch virtual programs? I think they will. I think we're when they are created at the level that you, the Jack Quartet, are working with the deep commitment and profound knowledge, uh, I think people will, but I think it's crucial that we do it. And we are, we're very, very pleased to be able to collaborate with you in this. That, that I think, comes to the end of my questions for you, all of you. Is there anything that you want to say about the residency, about your plans for the spring, any new projects, anything to wrap up with? I just wanted to say, um, Jeffrey, I really liked what you talked about with communal sharing. And it made me think one thing that I've always really loved about both performing and also about working with composers is that there's sort of an, an there's a built-in vulnerability there that um, composers make themselves vulnerable to the performers, performers make themselves vulnerable to audiences, um, and it's such a to me that creates such a rich way to communicate as humans as civilization, um, and like the more vulnerable we can make each other to each available to each other, I think the more we can really commune and to just asking, what, you know, what does it mean? I mean, I think that that's a big part of what music means to me. And that definitely exists on the internet or in real life. Um, just if music is happening, that is happening. And that's what I appreciate. That's, that's wonderful to hear that. Yeah, I agree. Well, that I think I think that is a wonderful note to end on. It's an optimistic note and a very lovely one. So thank you so much for being the Jack Quartet and being Jeffrey Mumford. Well, thank you we for including me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.